Wow, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, My name is uh, Dr. Stephen Odaibo, uh, and I'm so delighted to uh, chair the symposium this morning. I am founder and CEO of Retina AI Health uh, Incorporated, and by background, I am a retina specialist, a mathematician, a computer scientist, uh, and a full stack AI engineer. We have a wonderful program and uh, a phenomenal array of speakers uh, lined up for us today. And so we're, we're very delighted uh, that you all are here. Um, this indeed is the most expertly panel that has ever been assembled for artificial intelligence and technology in the world, period. Um, yes, you know, we have people here. We have people here uh, from some of the biggest companies. I can't wait to sit down and, and just listen and learn and take notes. Um, we're we're going to be opening with uh, a keynote address by Dill Webster, who's a technical lead at the Google Brain team. Uh, and then we're going to be seeing an array of uh, speakers uh, from the top leaders at Microsoft and Uswar Trivedi uh, will be speaking. Anika Goodwin is an innovator pioneer who uh, started a telemedicine company. Is going to be talking. Zubion Wuta will be talking about uh, EEG devices uh, for Zoom, optical Zoom, uh, really futuristic stuff. Uh, and uh, Brian Dornbos is doing some phenomenal work uh, in San Francisco using VR technology uh, to do perimetry as well as to train children with strabismus. Uh, I'm so excited. I'm humbled to be in, in uh, all of you's presence. And we're going to be closing with a closing keynote address by Dr. Michael Abramoff, who pioneered uh, and has been working in this field for over 20 years and pushed the very first autonomous AI device through the FDA. So it's definitely a phenomenal panel. Uh, and without further ado, uh, we're going to um, begin. And so, <clears throat> allow me to introduce uh, with great delight our opening keynote speaker, uh, Dill Webster. And uh, Dill Webster is a brilliant scientist who started out his career uh, work in computer science and then went to do bioinformatics at UCSF. Uh, and he has published in the top journals uh, in medicine. Uh, doing work at E. coli and has multiple publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, his focus at Google, he's a staff software engineer, he's at Google AI team, and he's focusing on bringing aut automated analysis of medical imaging to the world using deep learning. Uh, prior to his time at Google, he was a senior software engineer at Pacific Biosciences, working on DNA sequencing and genomics. Um, his PhD work in bioinformatics was at the University of California in San Francisco, and he focused on viral evolution, uh, and that work resulted indeed in multiple uh, publications that changed the landscape of that field forever. Uh, he received his BS in computer science from Rice University in Houston. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Dale Webster. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dale Webster, and I work at Google AI on a team that focuses on finding ways to use AI to improve patient care. And today I'll be talking to you about uh, some of our work in ophthalmology. So when we think about what are the right problems to use AI for in healthcare, the two things we tend to think about are problems where there's a lot of data that needs to be look at, looked at or looked parsed through and problems where expertise is very limited. And you can see, you can, there are many problems in medicine where this is the case. Uh, the proliferation of new technologies, especially around imaging, has resulted in massive amounts of data, and uh, doctors are spending more and more time looking through this data to help diagnose a patient. Uh, screening and routine imaging is, is a, one good example of this. In addition, the expertise is limited, so uh, for, for a lot of these technologies, it takes a lot of training to be able to diagnose disease from these images, and so having enough doctors to, to meet the patient needs uh, is often a bottleneck. Uh, for example, you can see in this graph on the right, this is a graph showing, uh, demonstrates a world shortage of radiologists, uh, but there's similar graphs for uh, many other areas of expertise in imaging. So one example of this uh, is diabetic retinopathy. So uh, there are 415 million people in the world with diabetes, and all of them are at risk for diabetic retinopathy. And I don't really want to sign up to the internet right now. Uh, 
And regular screening is key to preventing this disease. So annual screening uh, is, uh, it has been shown to be cost effective. Uh, and really all you need for this is a fundus camera and someone to take the photo and then someone who can interpret it. But it's that last step that's actually the challenge. Uh, for many of you in this room, this won't be a surprise, but di diabetic retinopathy is diagnosed on a, a five point grading scale from no diabetic retinopathy to mild, moderate, severe, and proliferative. And the challenge here is that many of the pathologies that you need to find in the image here are, are difficult to find. They're hard to spot f uh, even for trained experts, and it takes years of training to become good at this. So one example um, of a place in the world where, where this, is, this problem is felt very strongly is India. Uh, this is a picture of one of the partner hospitals we work with in India, Shankara where uh, there's estimated to be a shortage of 127,000 eye doctors in India. So uh, if we were able to suddenly bring into existence all these new doctors and, and have them in the right places, we could screen many, many more people for this disease. Uh, and because of this lack of, of expertise, uh, approximately 45% of patients suffer vision loss before diagnosis. Uh, and this is entirely unwarranted. The, the disease is easily treatable uh, when identified and caught early. So luckily, uh, our group, as well as several other groups around the world, have had a lot of success over the last few years in, in training AI to do this diagnosis step. So this is a graph uh, showing the performance, uh, or showing uh, the ability to diagnose the disease from the images. Uh, up and to the left here is, is, is good, is, is accurate. If you were up in that top left corner, you'd be diagnosing this perfectly every time. Uh, the green line here uh, shows the performance of our AI algorithm. The green dots are ophthalmologists' performance, and the orange dots there are uh, retina specialists. So you can see in, in 2016, we published a paper showing that you know, with deep learning, we could achieve a generous level, a generous level uh, or ophthalmologist level performance. Uh, and then in 2018, in ophthalmology, we published a, a paper showing specialist level performance. Um, so this is really exciting. It means that uh, we have the ability to, to sort of scale that expert diagnosis step that's so important. But building the model is just the first step. Uh, there are many, many challenges beyond that in how do you take something like an AI model and, and bring it to the world in a way where you can actually help patients. Uh, to do that, we, we can't do it alone, so we partner with many, many partners. Uh, Verily and Nikon, we've partnered with to uh, provide not only an algorithm, but easy to use cameras and software to make this more useful. And uh, we recently got a CE mark for uh, the diabetic, one of our diabetic retinopathy products, and we're working with the FDA to get approval in the US. And at the same time, we're working with hospitals and healthcare providers in India, US, and Thailand to validate and make sure this, uh, this technology actually adds value and, and can help patients uh, when it uh, hits the road. A specific example of this is a recent study we did in Thailand um, where we screened, we used this algorithm to screen uh, 7,500 7, patients, 25,000 total images across th 13 different health regions in Thailand. Uh, and we were able to show that uh, the eye could catch 97, excuse me, 97 percent uh, of cases uh, versus the trained graders in Thailand who are only catching about 74 uh, percent with a relatively small drop in specificity. So uh, we over referred just a few more people. Uh, so that was a, a retrospective study we did in Thailand and, and the confidence we built from that is allowing us to run a prospective study which is now underway. And in India, we're a few steps ahead of that. We've already run retrospective and prospective studies, and we're working on figuring out, okay, now that we know this works in India, how do we build it up and, and reach more patients? So everything I've talked about so far has been uh, around using the, the standard diabetic retinopathy grading scale um, and using grading scales that are codified by doctors. But one of the interesting things about deep learning is that you don't have to explain to it how to make a diagnosis. So for example, uh, when it's learning to diagnose diabetic retinopathy, we don't, talk, we don't teach it necessarily about microaneurysms and heart exudates. We instead say, okay, here's an input image. Uh, please predict this severity. And it learns on its own what features to look for. So we can take that a step further after we decide not to sign on to the internet. We can take that a step further by 
uh, instead asking it to, instead of predicting this grading scale, uh, the grading scales are actually generally a proxy for will this patient progress to a later form of disease. So we can ask it instead just to predict whether the patient, directly whether this patient will progress to a later stage of disease. Uh, for example, this is a work we published recently uh, where we asked it to, um, for patients with uh, interme intermediate AMD, we asked it whether, to predict whether or not this patient would progress to neovascular AMD within a year. Uh, and we compared this, so we, asked, we trained an algorithm to do this, and then we compared the performance to what if you relied on, on the existing standards of codified AMD diagnosis to do this. And so the blue line here is using the four category uh, AMD categorization. And the AUC, which is the performance here, is 0.5, which is actually totally random. Uh, but this is good. This makes sense because uh, in four category AMD, there's, there's no difference between intermediate and neovascular AMD. Uh, in the nine step, which actually can distinguish between these, uh, using the diagnosis gives you a, an AUC or a predictive power of 0.67. Uh, and the model was able to get a predictive power of 0.77, so significantly better uh, than the existing grading standards. Another place where we can use this, uh, this sort of direct prediction trick is in, in DME. So here we, we decided that we wanted to ask the algorithm to instead of predicting from a fundus photo uh, a DME grade uh, using the hard exudates near the macula, which is the sort of standard way of predicting this from a, from a fundus photo, uh, we ask it instead to predict what an OCT would say for this patient. So OCTs generally are a, a better way of detecting uh, DME. So we, for, for a group of patients, for about 10,000 patients, uh, we took OCTs uh, and diagnosed DME based on the OCT. And then we asked the algorithm to try to predict those diagnoses, but only gave it the fundus photo, so we didn't give it the OCT. And uh, you can see on the right here, it did a surprisingly good job. This is another ROC curve, so up and to the left is good. Uh, here, the red dots are, are ophthalmologists or retina specialists who are using this hard exit, it's near the macula rule, that's typically used for predicting DME from fundus photos. And the line there uh, is the algorithm that's actually trying to predict the OCT grade directly. So it, it's able to get much closer to an OCT level diagnosis uh, by using extra information. And the intuition about why this works is that even though it's a, two, a fundus is a 2D image um, and the, the 3D you get from an OCT is, is helpful, there is some 3D information in that fundus photo and the deep learning is able to pull it out. Thank you. Another area where we're using, uh, we're sort of going uh, a step beyond and, and thinking more about, uh, so I just, actually let me go back to this real quick. The other thing that makes me really excited about this is what this enables is o almost OCT level standard of care for diagnosing DME uh, with a device, a fundus camera that's much, much more accessible uh, and present in many more places around the world. So um, this is kind of a general theme that we're excited about is can we use deep learning to enable uh, more data collection, better, better, more accurate care using less expensive uh, devices and technologies. So another example of that um, is actually moving now away from eye disease into systemic disease. Uh, so there's the fundus photo and, and it, the eye in particular is very interesting because you can see a lot of things in the eye that you can't see other ways. You can see blood vessels and uh, things that are you know, normally internal to the body and very hard to, to look at. So we thought, what else can we see? What can, what can we measure using these photos? And so we tried to predict anemia. So for a few thousand patients, uh, we had fundus photos and we had data on whether they had anemia or not. And from metadata for the patient, so age, gender, things like this, uh, we were able to predict whether they had anemia or not with an AUC of 0.73, which is the black line here. Uh, but using a, a deep learning system to try to predict this directly, we got an AUC of 0.88, which is kind of like intriguing. This is a very small data set, uh, so it's definitely not a result we can take and, and, and build a product out of, but it's a, it's a good first step and a proof of concept that will follow up with much more investigation. A similar problem we tried to tackle that's potentially much higher impact is cardiovascular disease. Uh, so very similar to the previous problem, we have fundus photos and we know whether these patients, uh, we know the, the cardiovascular risk factors these patients had and we can predict those directly. 
Uh, and we can show, I guess you can see in the little insets here, various cardiovascular risk factors, age, self-reported sex, HbA1c, uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, these are all things that we can predict reasonably well from a fundus uh, to varying degrees. Some of them are like, surprisingly accurate, like self-reported sex. Others are uh, less accurate. But the more interesting prediction is we can then directly predict what their five-year risk of uh, heart attack is. Uh, and we got an AUC of 0.7 there, which is, is not, you know, something, once again, not something we can ship, but it's intriguing and it's something we're, we're following up with uh, and trying it on different data sets, increasing the amount of training data and seeing if we can do better. So I talked about uh, predicting diabetic retinopathy, predicting systolic, or, sorry, predicting anemia, predicting cardiovascular risk. Um, this is a really small slice of the interesting, the ways that we can bring AI to healthcare in interesting ways. Um, and uh, it's a big challenge. There are many, many things to do. And so one of the things that we care a lot about is making this technology, the AI development technology, available as widely as possible. So we release tools like TensorFlow, uh, Google Cloud ML Engine, uh, to, to make it so that everyone can actually participate in this, in this journey towards a world where we have AI augmenting uh, the practice of medicine. Uh, and so this is, uh, there have been a lot of examples, this is just a few of um, folks outside of Google using Google tools to, uh, to tackle some of these big problems. Uh, and it's very inspiring and uh, I hope to see many, many more of these, uh, hopefully from some of the folks in, these, in this room. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, is the, the technology that showed the f prediction of five-year risk commercially available? Uh, no, it's a very early result. This is sort of uh, one data set uh, where we showed this. Uh, we expect you know, the usual uh, multiple years of, of sort of improving the technology of validating it in clinical settings. Um, so I would say this is far from being commercially available. Uh, it's much more of a, a science result at this point that we hope to build on. So the dollars to do the validation and the, uh, and the subsequent work, do you have a sense of where that's coming from? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, so, Where's the money coming from for the validation? Yeah, so... Um, that's a good question. So in general, I mean, most of these, it's a bit of a mix, I guess. Uh, there are a lot of the work that's being done in the diabetic retinopathy validation. Uh, it's not us that's doing it. It's the partner hospitals in, in Thailand and in India. The governments of, of Thailand is particularly interested in this. Uh, so it's, it's, I guess, coming from some of the same sources where the screening dollars are coming from in this case. Uh, for the more far out there things, uh, it's, I guess, yet to be determined. Uh, we're, these are things we're just starting to think about how to validate them. Uh, not right now, um, but we're very open to new partnerships, and we're always we're always excited to talk to folks who are interested in participating. Sorry. Oh yes. Sorry. Uh, the question was whether we were partnering with uh, the National Medical Association or hospitals in the Caribbean, in Africa. Um, we're. I think we have some early potential partnerships in areas of Africa. Lily, actually, who sits right across from you, uh, is more up to date on uh, the specific partnerships we have. Um, but it's definitely something we're interested in doing. Other questions? Yes. Okay, the question was, uh, what is the data set in some of the original graphs that I showed for diabetic retinopathy? Uh, I believe the graph, the specific graph I showed was an IPAX data set. Um, in the papers, we also typically compare against Mesador, uh, which is a, a more easily accessible data set, yes. Um, and we actually, um, we've actually published or made available the, the diagnosis that we use for Mesador um, on the Kaggle website, so you can actually access those there. Are you saying that you're, you're making some of them available 
are they open source tools or are they uh, proprietary tools you have to sort of learn? Yeah, so the question was, what, uh, the tools I mentioned, are they open source or are they proprietary? Uh, so TensorFlow uh, is, I think, the most widely used uh, AI, uh, open source AI platform. Um, so that one is open source. Uh, the other one I mentioned was Cloud ML Engine, uh, which is a bit more like a service, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, freely available and you can uh, upload images and uh, it will train an AI algorithm for you. A question here? Yes. Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, was the strategy, is the strategy that we imagine focused more on primary care or specialists? Uh, we would, in general, like to push things more and more to primary care because what, you know, one of the things we care most about is making this available to as many people as possible. So the further sort of upstream in the care funnel we can push it, the better. Uh, yes. Messador 2 labels have been made open source by Google. Yes. Uh, however, the labels are available, but the images themselves are not no longer available. That that. Yes, which I did not know till you emailed me. Um, yeah, I haven't, uh, I don't actually know the, the, the folks who provide the images. Um, we sort of downloaded them the same, the same way you would, were trying to. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to, we should probably contact them and find out why they're not available. Yeah, so the question was very promising, but what are the drawbacks potentially around regulation? Um, I think the drawbacks around regulation are it, it takes a long time. Um, I think, so we've been engaging very actively with the FDA um, for, uh, for US, and we, we have the CE mark, so that was actually um, relatively straightforward to, to get the CE mark. It's a little more difficult than the US with the FDA, uh, but we have very active conversations with them. Uh, they're actually getting a pretty good understanding of what deep learning is and how it might be deployed. It's a very challenging problem, so it's going to take a little while, but uh, I think we'll, we'll get to a place where, where it's going to work. Wow, what a wonderful keynote address, and um, uh, it's truly remarkable what Google is doing in this space. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Webster, for that f a fantastic presentation.